जय हिंद एंड वेलकम टू डेफ टॉक्स दिस इज आदि अचिन Afghanistan there's a lot being spoken about Afghanistan and a lot has happened in the past few days in this country and begs the question to all of us what were the causes that led to this situation that we see in unfolding in front of us the afghan army's resistance unfelt the taliban themselves reach kabul in a surprisingly sh- short time remains to be seen how these events unfold and the kind of humanitarian crisis which we see unfolding in front of us Loads of discussions have been done in the manner that the US troops withdrew and the effects that are going to come after that. I have with me to discuss this particular subject Lieutenant General Sanjeev Langar and Lieutenant General Syed Atta Hasnain. General Sanjeev Langar, PVSM AVSM, former DG DIA, also a former co-commander of 21 Corps, the Strike Corps, the member of the Armed Forces Tribunal. and also has been deputed to the united nations headquarters in new york general hasnain pvsm ubism avsm sm bsm and bart vsm a former core commander of 15 core with seven tours in jnk that is something which is going to be in focus from now on and also the chancellor of central university in kashmir both of these gentlemen are eminent writers and speakers on various different subjects regarding national security and geopolitics welcome both you general sir thank you general langar i like i like to start with you sir a lot of voices within the us today are talking about the united states having lost a very strategic base in afghanistan which could have been used to counter china as well as russia in this subcontinent as a land base uh the loss of afghanistan they say is going to lose this particular you know advantage that the us had may i request for your thoughts on this subject sir well uh, you know let's get some facts straight about afghanistan uh, and i don't want to go into uh, past history but i want to go into the recent history which impacts the situation as it is now 1979 to 1989 you had the mujahideen fighting against the soviet invasion and occupation and as far as the americans are concerned that was a very successful campaign and uh, and they got great success out of it but what this did is it gave a huge amount of centrality to the pashtuns and to pakistan and to the afpak region now you must uh, we must realize that the pashtuns are 38.5% of the total population but the two other major uh, minorities which is the tajik and the hazara is close to 45% so this entire section was ignored and all the focus went to the mujahideen which is predominantly pashtun then of course after this great victory pakistan and the mujahideen are left to their own devices and then you come you know fast forward 2001 global war on terror they, because kabul was captured by them 2002 hamid karzai become president 2003 the us changes focus and goes to iraq and it leaves uh, afghanistan through political devices and wants to outsource the entire problem to a 48 nation um uh, coalition right right and then the us continues with this two eyed focus all the way up to uh, 2011 uh, with uh, the iraq could being able to push the isis into a corner in iraq but then it hops over to syria so it continues with this two eyed focus right till 2011 it says that it's going to withdraw now 2011 2012 i would say is the, is the beginning of the present crisis by this time the center of gravity has shifted to the taliban they are the ones who are calling the shots the us has an ambitious plan called intikal which has five phases phase 4 and 5 the last two phases are meant for the afpak region it never gets off the ground because it's scheduled to happen in 2012-13 and they're hoping that negotiations will allow them to get away from this uh, intikal implementation in any case they couldn't implement it. all right and and then there onwards you see the center of gravity slowly being grabbed by the taliban and and you come to the present state where uh, the us is you know the penultimate days of its withdrawal and um, uh, they they really have very little 
shall I say, leverage which is left. Now, with that as a background, to answer your question pointedly about patience, I do not agree with that view. All right. Starting from Turkey to Djibouti, the US has something like 30 known bases. Unknown, we won't talk about. All right, because we don't know about them. And this is not counting Diego Garcia. Mm. Globally, they are supposed to have close to 800 bases. They have 150,000 to 200,000 men in uniform overseas. They have found it far more expedient to operate from the bases which ring Afghanistan than from bases in Afghanistan because you have to fight to keep the base secure. Why waste that effort when you can do it from bases which are on the rim, number one? Number two, the US is the only nation which retains the capability to fight in an expeditionary mode from what they call lily pads. They can put out a couple of carrier groups, place them on the high seas, and operate freely off them from wherever they want and in whichever direction. So why waste effort with Afghanistan? I think that hard logic is, is, uh, is answers uh, the specific question you have in mind that have they compromised any basis. Thank you for clarifying that, sir. I think there's the opposition to the present uh, government in US is also going to be doing a little bit of politics on this. And these are the voices which are trying to be a little strategic. General Snen, coming to you, sir. Do you think, you know, uh, I'm going to take the US pull out as a baseline and ask you this question that, do you think, was there another way for the United States to actually pull out without resulting in the chaos they've called, caused the complete capitulation of the ANDSF? The question that begs to a lot of people's mind is that, did they have an idea of this outcome? Was this actually part of the deal that they signed with the Taliban in February? Interesting set of questions, uh, Adi. But before that, let me add a line or two to what General Langer said. Uh, while entirely endorsing what he said, Afghanistan, Pakistan, both of them as physical entities available to the uh, United States um, as bases in the heydays of, of CETO CENTO was something different. Technology was also not the same at that time. Remember, if you if you if, if we can recall, uh, one of the major things of uh, being in Pakistan and including Pakistan as a part of the uh, CENTO, uh, you know, setup at that time was primarily to act as a base from where they could carry out a certain amount of peeping into, into uh, the so then Soviet Union. Those days are gone. Today, today satellite imagery, this kind of thing, everything is available. And as he very correctly said, why be there to fight? Why not fight from somewhere else? That's the whole concept of maneuver anyway. Be somewhere, be far away from the area where you're going to fight. Right? So I entirely endorse what he said. Coming back to your question, could this have been done differently as far as the move out was concerned? I'll start by saying the most difficult operation of war, and I'm sure General Langer will agree with me, is the withdrawal operation of war. You know, advance, attack, defense are comparatively simple things. But to actually plan a withdrawal is one of the most difficult things. Because you've got to keep an intact front. I think the basic principles of war were just not followed here. They just compromised on keeping an intact front. You can draw out everything from behind. But you have to have a compact front. And you've got to have layback positions, which means to something to fall back upon. Here, one fine day you take a decision uh, after 20 years to upstake and take out everything you have, realize the folly that you've created, and then attempt to go back there, which is what they've done now to come back to Bagram and places to the Kabul airport and places like that. I mean, this is military incompetence of the highest order. It hasn't occurred because the political community was not listening to the strategic community, military community in the United States. So was this purely and personally a decision by President Biden is something which is going to be contested, spoken about, analyzed for many years to come, right? Of course, the best way to do it would have been, they already had just about 3,000 troops there, uh, as it is. Bagram should have been held. Or the conditions should have been created to keep, keep it intact, right? The, the, the failure, of course, is the fact that they trusted they have one national security forces. They had confidence in them. 
uh, but that, that, was, that was the biggest upset to them when they realized that they just could not stick it out. They had a different set of plans. The commanders of the ANSF had already carried out their uh, approach to the Taliban. All that was a big letdown for them that they were not aware of. Intelligence on which this entire thing should have been based should have been 100%. But this is again a great thrilling. Where at the time of withdrawal, your intelligence, which should be so strong, was absolutely unavailable to them completely. So some of the basic principles of, of a withdrawal operation of war were really never adhered to in this particular case. I'm sure a good uh, strategic planner in India may have been able to advise them better on doing, on doing this. Because we, have, we keep doing this from time to time, talking about it, discussing it here and there. But I'm surprised that this, this uh, came to such a sorry pass as far as the American decision making was concerned. Yeah. Thank you for putting that in perspective, sir. Before I go to General Langer, I'd like to also ask you for your comments on the weapons left behind, sir. See, uh, but this is a very interesting question. And what effect does it have? You see, the... the uh, the fact is that there are about 160 aircraft in the hands of the ANSF. All of them are not runners. 50% of them may be runners. It's a, an agglomeration of uh, all kinds of different, different aircraft. Many pilots have been killed. This is something the Taliban ensured. They went after the pilots, assassinated them. So there are not enough people to fly them also at the same time. So that's the air part, the rotary part. The ground part, lots and lots of Humvees, lots and lots of... Uh, Four-wheel runners, uh, many Indian trucks and all. The kind of piece of equipment is all there. Lots of signal equipment. But the really lethal things are uh, some pieces of artillery, which were also provided by India, some of them. And um, mortars, lots of heavy machine guns. That's one of the mainstays of this, of this war it has been. Heavy machine guns were, were used very extensively. But the most, none of these weapons... Well, all these weapons falling in the hands of the Taliban does enhance their capability. But uh, these are not weapons which can sort of find a way from Pakistan into Kashmir and into other areas of incidency and things like that. What we have to be concerned about is those 350,000, uh, supposedly 350,000 personal weapons, small arms. The M4 rifles, the Kalashnikovs, advanced versions, whatever it is, these are the ones. Not to say that there was a shortage of weaponry in Pakistan that enough enough weapons all over the uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa or these uh, badlands of Pakistan from where the whole pipeline is available to bring it to Kashmir. So it's just that there's an overkill of it is available now. The issue is not the availability of weapons. It is the question of bringing them into Kashmir. That's not going to be an easy one. It's not as if that there is a push from behind so those weapons just land up in the, in the, in the Kashmir Valley or in the Jammu region. That's not going to be so uh, at all. A lot of people are misreading and just saying this, that, you know, sudden availability of so many weapons out here is going to create a security problem for India, etc. I don't agree with that. That's not true. This, this kind of a situation existed. And it's only that more and more weapons are in the pipeline. It has created a problem in the general area. I mean, in the sense that some of it, many of these things will go into Central Asia. The potential of it reaching into Zindia. It's not just that India is vulnerable. The area, the whole area is vulnerable. The Russians are concerned. The Chinese are concerned about Central Asia, about Xinjiang. The Iranians are concerned. So everyone has their concerns. about. It. Interesting. Uh, General Sanjeev, sir, I'd like to ask you about the politics. You know, the uh, my focus would be regarding the leadership of Afghanistan, which, uh, you know, a large sect initially in the first few days felt literally, you know, went away from the scene, which is the case with Ashraf Ghani. Uh, do you think his departure and so sudden departure made things worse for the whole situation? Would you agree to this entire thing? And what would be your, uh, you know, uh, logic behind this? Also a word on the vice president who's now standing uh, in the Panjshir Valley, sir. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I will go to that. If I may just add a couple of things to what Atta said. Um, I think the two biggest um, flaws in, in the entire US configuration uh, was firstly dealing with the ANA and the ANP, uh, the army and the police. They were initially conceptualized not in the mold 
of a national force. A national sovereign army is supposed to ensure the defense of the country and is supposed to ensure the writ of the government runs. The manner in which these forces were configured, they were light counter-terrorism forces with no heavy weaponry, no orientation to borders, and they were more or less thought of as an adjunct to the 48 nation coalition. Now, that is not how you build a, a national army. So when you have a building block, basic building block like that, you can't blame them when they are confronted with this kind of a, a heavy violence being propagated by Taliban, which is actually Taliban being fully backed by Pakistan. The UN estimates which came out recently says there are about 6,000 Pakistani nationals operating on the other side of Khyber Pakhtunwa. All right. So uh, the first flaw is that you thought of this as an adjunct for counterterrorism. It was not a national force to support Hamid Karzai's government, right? Second, as you went along, you realized, okay, look, things are not going well. Taliban is, is, is getting out of hand. Pakistan is, you know, talking with a forked tongue, which it normally does. So uh, let's start giving them heavy, giving heavy weaponry, giving heavy armaments to a force. Their integration and their usage are two separate things, all right? They've given too late. They're far too late, all right? In my mind, I would say if there was a benchmark, they had the opportunity to 2011, 12, right? To rectify and look at a different way of exiting from this situation. Many of the ingredients have been said like uh, by, by Atha and he's actually right. You don't give up hard bases. You don't give up firm bases in deep uh, territory. But all that was compromised and what you got is a collapse. And uh, you know, the media is, is, is flaring, flaring up this collapse as happening in the last month. It's been happening since the beginning of 2021. The first quarter of 2021 has recorded 35% more violent incidents than 2020. And then I, I've got a whole list of how the districts have fallen. They've started falling from the month of April. It's only now that the scramble to Kabul has taken place and so we, we are all in focus. Okay, let's get to the politics. The politics in Afghanistan, even in the period of Hamid Karzai, has always been in the form of a compromise, right? And the compromise was because of the demographic and the ethnographic nature of that nation. And the history which I gave you, you've always been prop, propping up the Pashtuns. You never looked at, at, at these very, very significant minorities. The significant minorities riding the back of the Northern Alliance and, uh, and, and uh, the Northern Alliance Tiger of Penchief had to fight for themselves and took Kabul and fought all these territories on their own. Of course, assisted, but they were not in your focus. Okay, so take Hamid Karzai. The first government of Hamid Karzai, the most of the time of uh, Zalma Khalizad, the special representative, was spent trying to uh, solidify his government because the majority of the people with him in the cabinet were non-Pashtun starting with his vice president, okay? There was a time when Hamid Karzai was scared about being knocked off himself and his personal security was taken over by the Americans. Now, you, you, do, you, you don't run a country like that, right? You, you don't get to have a feeling of nationalism and a sense of uh, individuality as in Afghanistan uh, with a situation like that. But I, to his credit, I must say, two tenures he did, and by the second tenure, things had settled and they were working in a particular direction. He could not hold the majority and you get the new president. The new president comes, Bhani, in a strange situation where he has a counter, Abdullah Abdullah, who says, I'm president. And both of them have to be taken behind the scenes to make some kind of a compromise. You make the compromise, but Abdullah Abdullah remains central by being the chief executive. And again, in the cabinets, you see, the cabinet ministers, you see a fracture between the factions. But I do believe, and I believe the reports are correct, that the last three years of the Ghani government, he has given up all hope of governance. And the extreme corruption and the extreme, shall I say, bureaucratic antipathy that set in has actually helped the Taliban do their takeover of various districts. And if you look at the manner in which they have taken the districts, they have crossed the ethnic divide. 
I just spoke to you about ethnicity. But the people had no other hope. And a lot of people have signed in. Towns have just given it willingly. And districts have given it willingly to the Taliban because they signed them the only hope. So they've crossed the ethnic divide because of the last three years of corruption. Interesting, sir. May I request you to just dwell a little bit about, uh, you said the Pashtuns were propagated up most of the time. Uh, any reason for that, sir? No, the reason for that was very simple because the Mujahideen who were uh, at the doorstep of Pakistan were predominantly Pashtun. So right. it's pa Pakistan and Ziaul Zia Haq, who ran this entire Islamicization program in Pakistan, in which he even Islamicized the army and all institutions, he is the one who had this brainwave of setting up these hundreds of madarsas to get talent from across the world. Chechens were coming, people from Arabia were coming, people from all over were coming to fight jihad. All right, they were funded by out of area entities, they were funded by other nations. And Ziaul Haq set up this entire system. He set up a factory of terrorism. All right. And where was it all being poured? It was all being poured across the uh, you know, northwest frontier, which is now Khyber Pakhtunwa, into Afghanistan under the patronage of the Mujahideen who were Pashtun. Of course, Zia was no fool. He had a huge pipeline opening out into Pakistan. And whatever was the value from that funding, and whatever was the value of that equipment poured into the, the Pakistani armed forces. Sir, talking about internal politics, General Hassan, sir, Taliban today is the internal politics of Afghanistan, if I may just uh, use that phrase loosely. We all know Taliban is not a monolith. It's a fractions which have got together in some form or the other to form this sort of an organization. One of the biggest challenges I see for the leadership of the Taliban is to keep these fractions together. Um, one, keeping them together under a general directive. Two, ensuring that they are not in their wild, if I may, you know, uh, I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. Do you think that they will be able to actually do this because their challenge is the recognition which they're looking for? See, uh, Adi, the answer to that lies partially in what John Langer was stating at the end of his last intervention. Uh, in fact, rarely do you find people today talking about what John Langer just spoke about. And that is the events which go back to 1977, the rise of Ziaul Haq, the coming of Ziaul Haq, the creation of the grand strategy of Pakistan the, for the Islamization, which would be ultimately used not only in Afghanistan, but actually against India. The aim of that whole thing was against India. The creation of the Taliban happened to be because there were 3 million refugees who had come out from uh, Afghanistan during the Soviet war. Those were the ones who were exploited. Uh, there were camps set up all over. Money came in from uh, different countries. The Americans provided the weaponry, you're aware. And most of the clergy came from Saudi Arabia. It is the obscurantist, uh, the obscurantist ideology, Islamic ideology, which was employed primarily to uh, act as a glue for all these elements to come together, it became Islamism became the main issue. Now, if that be so, uh, 40 years down the line after 1981, is Islamism still the glue for the for the Taliban? That's the question which not too many people have been able to answer. The Taliban has obviously evolved, war fighters uh, and things like that. Uh, uh, they, they, they fought uh, bravely on the, even the battlefield, whatever they have done, whatever they have done, in whichever manner they have done. But has this changed their colors ideologically? Because uh, too many interest groups have emerged. There's the Doha group, as you're aware, which for the last three years is camped in the five-star hotels of Qatar and uh, very well in const there. Uh, lots of people are jealous of them. There are others who, are, who, who have been the ground fighters uh, in the field. There are others who are at the middle level, the low, lower layers. So there are, there are different interest groups and there are different ethnic groups within this. John Langer spoke about the largest ethnic group being the Pashtuns, but then the combination of the Hazaras and uh, the others combined comes to, come, comes to almost 45%, as, as, as you said. So obviously the, the Taliban is not a monolith. But what uh, attempts to make them into a monolith is the backing that Pakistan gives them today. 
for Pakistan, the most important thing is to ensure the unity of the Taliban, right? Because otherwise, if there are if there are splits within the Taliban, it says they are not people who are not listening to Pakistan. There would be possibilities of other countries also cultivating them, including the suspicion that Pakistan will always have is the possibility of India entering into the fray there, into the back channels somewhere, somewhere in that area also. So Pakistan will continue making these efforts. It is already making serious efforts, as you're aware. Um, Shah Mahmood Qureshi was supposed to be going there, but he has not yet gone there. Uh, but I'm sure in the very near future, you're going to find uh, the Pakistan foreign minister there. The ISI will be there in good strength. The fighters are already there. So at different layers, you'll find the Pakistani presence there who will try and make sure that the Taliban holds on in a kind of a unified way. I, I do foresee problems taking place in this. Lots and lots of uh, analysts have written about it. The outcome may become very negative for Pakistan itself uh, in the near future because Pakistan doesn't have much to contribute except uh, perhaps the, the backing of a large nation. They don't have the finances, etc. They got the experience, no doubt. They've handled this kind of a situation two to three times before, but they don't have the financial muscle. But they've got the ability to link up with uh, China provide some kind of financial backing from China. So the Taliban will be under a form of control of Pakistan, but given a moment somewhere here and there, there will be chinks in the armor. Now that is what exactly we should be looking for. India should be looking for those things. I'm sure already lots and lots of nations, in the intelligence circles, lots and lots of people are looking for those chinks to get in and exploit. I don't foresee a kind of national unity, the manner in which the last government was, at least that was a semblance of a government of national unity. But uh, a government of national unity under the Taliban immediately coming into being seems something quite remote at the moment. Interesting. I mean, um, <clears throat> Pakistan does play a very, very important role. And uh, I'd like to take the next question to General Langer. Uh, do you think the Taliban, which is it, in its press conferences, they've done two as of now, which are... Uh, being spoken about around the world and people seem to be quite impressed by what they say. That apart, do you think they would actually be able to form an inclusive government? Is That's what they're promising. And as uh, you know, General Hasnain also mentioned that Pakistan's role is going to be central in this entire thing. Uh, a lot of questions are also coming across with regards to the, uh, you know, will the Taliban actually give that sort of an ear to Pakistan and follow the, those directions? How do you see that going forward, sir? Well, you know, uh, one thing we have to credit the Taliban with, they are the most adaptable and they're the most uh, resilient group uh, that you can deal with in history. All right. They've been pushed to the margin so many times and they have bounced back and now they're, they're on the verge of, of, of establishing a nation. And the same is for the TTP, right? The, the, the cousin which is, which is hitting Pakistan. They have been pushed to the margin so many times, but they refuse to go down. You know, you've got to give them full marks for resilience and for the ability to adapt to circumstances. So the same for, the, for, the, for this phase. Right now, I mean, I'm echoing a lot of what Atta is saying. Right now, they have an intoxication where they feel they are going to get a nation. Up till now, they were on the margins as a as a group which was looked down upon as a group of terrorists who are trying to gain respectability. All right. Then they gained the center of gravity and they were fated by Russia, China, uh, United States. They're fated by them, right? Because they, they became so powerful. Now they're in that stage of intoxication where they think they're going to get a nation, uh, an international recognition, and everything which goes with nation. So they are going to be consumed by this particular pursuit for the immediate future. And the biggest thorn in their side is what is happening in Panchir Valley. Okay? Because what all the people who have gone into Panchir Valley, from what it seems, are not going to be paid off, are not going to accept halfway house, are willing to fight. This may change tonight. It may change tomorrow. But it seems like that today. All right? So the first thing for them is recognition, acceptance, and consolidation of what their dream is of becoming a nation. All right. If that does not happen, then fissiparious tendencies, which are inherent in their nature, will come to the fore. Right. 
as far as pakistan is concerned let's be very clear that pakistan has played a good set of cards but as the days go by and as the taliban consolidates more and more pakistan becomes more and more irrelevant okay the controls over the taliban by pakistan were basically over the three shuras of peshawar uh, quetta and miramshah but that once you running a nation that and you have international recognition that becomes irrelevant okay don't forget that pakistan has a concept of strategic space but that concept of strategic space is negative and positive both they are hoping like hell to get security on their western border which has eluded them for the last two decades there is no guarantee of it even when the taliban could act against the ttp they did there is no history of them being able to play to the tune that pakistan wants them to there is a hope that pakistan has that it will happen i am not so sure knowing the afghan nature and knowing the pashtun nature which is completely antithetical to the punjabi and the plainsmen i am not so sure that this is going to happen that easy right even china and russia which which are, which are wooing them are wooing them very with a lot of caution because they are scared as atha said of the spillover into the central indian uh, the central Asian republics, as also in, into Xinjiang, right? So it's all very good to say we will help you with minerals and stuff like that. That's a great idea, but first let's get security, you know. Okay. So I feel in the short term they are not going to crack. If their objective is denied to them, then the fissiparious tendencies will come to the fore. As it is, the Taliban today is not what it was. Taliban started with a predominantly Kandar based. Uh, Kader, it is a much wider Kader. Look at the Hakani network. Hakani is now number two. He is the deputy commander in the Taliban network. Hakani runs a perfectly, uh, uh, shall I say, effective independent empire. He can switch back into that empire any day. Okay. So if they are stymied, Swissiparis tendencies will come to the fore, and Pakistan is not going to really get what they are looking for. That is my feeling. Thank you, sir. General Nasrin, sir, coming to you, I'd I'd like you to comment on the Panjshir Valley. Uh, before I I actually my question is uh, you know about Pakistan. But before I actually before I request you to uh, answer that question, I'd like you to put some time to comment on the Panjshir Valley and the movements there. After that, sir, my question is uh, it's a very interesting sort of a thing. The world is aware of what Pakistan is doing, and even when the Taliban was a sanctioned organization. the world was still aware what what it, it was the pakistanis were up to in terms of giving them sanctuaries the shuras and so on and so forth we saw an outpouring of this sanction pakistan coming out last week from a lot of people across the world it wasn't just the afpak region and india included or the indian subcontinent uh, for that matter why in your opinion are no steps taken on this particular country and not even a talk about any future steps that need to be taken on towards pakistan sir Okay, I think I'll speak the second part first, and then come on to Panchel because Panchel, both uh, me and John Lando, we both uh, have to contribute to it. Certainly. Okay. So the the first part, why is uh, Pakistan treated as the holy cow by many and uh, not sanctioned, uh, so to say? This is something that we have been talking about for years. Uh, India has been making efforts to say that uh, state sponsorship of uh, uh, terrorism. has gone on from the pakistani uh, land space for years and years we were the first sufferers of terror no one bothered about it in the 90s it's only in 2001 after 911 that actually the world started focusing on uh, terror and uh, transnational terror in this particular way right. well one of the regions and the langar will like to contribute more to that for the strategic reasons is pakistan's geo strategic location itself you see uh, it's a it's a nation which is uh, no importance otherwise except the fact that there are 200 million muslims there right uh, impoverished uh, today foreign exchange reserves of 20 billion dollars against a neighbor with 620 billion dollars uh, is fallen back on development etc compared to even bangladesh which was once a part of it right uh, a fractious leadership um, major problems of radicalization within that Every problem 
problem you can think of is there in Pakistan. But the most important thing that Pakistan occupies is strategic space. If you notice, uh, the, this is something which I've all been regularly pointing out, five civilizations which exist around Pakistan's borders, major civilizations, Indian civilization, the Chinese, the Central Asian, the Persian, and the Arab. Each, each civilization represented by different, different nation states has got something to take away, something to offer. For example, in the last 20 years, the Americans, who are not even a civilization anywhere nearby, could not have fought a war in Afghanistan without the support of Pakistan. And after all the logistics were all from here, you couldn't have possibly fought a war with having airheads in Tajikistan and Turkmenistan. Right? Uh, it would have been phenomenally expensive. If it cost $2 trillion now, it would have probably cost $10 trillion. Right? So uh, Pakistan is that important. The access to the heart of Asia. Heart of Asia is, after all, Central Asia. The access to the heart of Asia. Exit from the heart of Asia, in the landlocked region of the Central Asian Republic. The area of the new great game, the old great game, so to say, then the new great game, which is all about today about, uh, it's about energy, it's about uh, uh, communication arteries, it's about uh, pipelines, it's about railways, and it's a lot to do with ideology. That's the space to which the world's major terrorist organizations are all, you know, moving. You're seeing that with the confusion in Afghanistan today, that's the place where the gravitation of all these elements is taking place. The IS is there. Al-Qaeda is there. Before you find lashkar e Taiba and Jashim Muhammad moving in there. The East Turkestan Islamic movement is there. I mean, every possible negative element is gravitating into, into this space, right? So Pakistan, at the end of the, the day, the nations, were, whoever is our major players, would always want to keep Pakistan on their side or at least keep Pakistan cultivated to an extent from where... We come back to the original question of basis. It's not, it's not the physical basis as such. It's, it's a keeping, a keeping a situation going, right? And from where you can use that space, not uh, physically, in different ways, use that space to actually counter all the movements which are taking place in the heart of Asia. This is the importance of Pakistan today. And this is one of the reasons why Pakistan gets away with Duma. The Chinese get access to north, the Northwest uh, Indian Ocean through Pakistan. The Russians are looking at Pakistan to make sure that the Pakistani influence does not flow or push um, more negativity, more obscurantism into the Central Asian republics. The Chinese are similarly feeling the same regarding Xinjiang. So that so much of all this, Pakistan remains a very important strategic space. That's the prime reason I personally, that's my, my assessment, of why I feel the, the potential of sanctioning Pakistan is still very remote. It may not happen in a, in a, in a hurry. Uh, your, your other question, let me initiate it. Yes. The question of Panjshir. This is very interesting. Today, uh, the figures today are six, approximately 6,000 fighters. And we know the history of the Panjshir. We know the history of the nine-party alliance. Most people are aware of it. Uh, India's support to it. Similarly, Iran's support to it also. Uh, can Amarullah Saleh, who I've met a number of times personally, I'm sure Dan Langer met him many times, heard him. Uh, whatever he's speaking today, I heard him on, on, uh, on the media today, whatever he's speaking, he has always been speaking. Most of that he has been speaking. And he's true to his word. I, th I think uh, you can trust him to that extent that uh, whatever he's saying is he's committed to try and do it. It's a very brave effort going on in the face of the kind of situation which is existing. And uh, with the whole country in the hands of the Taliban at the moment, you find a handful of fighters under a form of vice president. I don't call him a former vice president yet. Under a vice president who goes into the bush, uh, attacks a couple of fighters, brings in a bit of equipment and hopes to be able to put up a resistance movement. Now, for resistance movements, you require, of course, you need a core force. But after that, you need, need human resources. You need finances, you need weaponry. Most important of all, you need external support. None of us have got it. India doesn't have a common boundary in Afghanistan, let alone anything to do with Panjshir. Keeping lines open to Tajikistan is becoming a major problem. But if, uh, if uh, helicopter flights, etc., are taking place and if there is available space through which movement can take place, this can become the potential for a tremendous resistance movement. 
Can, are the Americans equal to it? Can the Americans take this up? I'm not so sure because the Americans at the moment are in a, in a tight negative spot. They are not thinking enough at the moment. They're not talking about the future at the moment. They're only looking at 31st of August uh, uh, currently. But I'm sure someone sitting in think tanks in America is looking at this very seriously and saying what could not be achieved by physical presence in Bagram and in Kabul can actually be achieved by proxy. And, and that is very much possible. That's very much possible. It's happened in the past with different in different areas of the world. So I do think there's a hope at the moment. But then there, there are also awkward reports coming out from there to say that um, actually um, Ahmed Masood is looking for, uh, you know, he's 31 years old, very young, inexperienced. He's uh, looking for some kind of a compromise uh, with the Taliban because he, th he seems to be thinking that he doesn't have the means and resources. And doesn't have the kind of international backing which is necessary to go ahead with a with a movement of this kind. So, General sir, uh, your comment, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first, about uh, Pakistan. I just want to say, as far as the U.S. is concerned, Pakistan, over the seven seven and a half decades of its existence, has been absolutely loyal to it. Okay. Uh, of course, that loyalty gets, uh, uh, shall I say, uh, infringed at times in, in self-interest. But by and large, whether it was CENTO or whether it is a one-on-one -on -one relationship, Pakistan has been exceedingly close to the U.S. establishment. And there are decades of people who have worked together who now have personal relationships, right? One of the hard calculations of the U.S., exiting Afghanistan is to confront their existential threats, which is China and Russia. And they don't want to, ex they don't want to confront these threats fighting on the streets of Kabul. All right. So they want to pull out and then re-pivot and face their existential threats, which is, are there at this point of time. For those threats, Pakistan is invaluable. It cannot be compromised. It cannot be allowed to go into the Chinese wake. All right. So there is no way that the US is going to carry out any infringement or sanctions on Pakistan because it is, it is critical to its own self-interest at this point in time. Right. One of the calculations of leaving Afghanistan is why not leave ambiguity on the Russian and the, I mean the Central Asian Republic and, and the Chinese borders? Leave the ambiguity. Rather than ambiguity, it's even better if you leave insecurity. What the hell? Let them open up separate fronts. So there are some hard calculations in the US thinking, apart from the financial load and apart from the simple fact that the budget is completely out of place. A, a modest estimate says $3 million every day. And there is a recurring cost on human beings who have been lost, which is going to go on and on and on. Okay. So if you look at the mood in the U.S., the mood in the U.S., what Atta was, was, was referring to, is in simple terms, let's get the hell out of there. Okay? And let's get the hell out of there doesn't give focus to the Panjshir Valley. Let me come to the Panjshir Valley. If the Panjshir Valley actually fights and it spills over into a nasty fight, and if they are going to become a hard point of resistance, you will see some people changing their mind and supporting them. If, however, they succumb and become part of some arrangement, then the issue is over. The Taliban also has to make a calculation when they enter into outright conflict in the Panjshir Valley. Because up till now, the sweep of the districts that they have taken, the conflicts have been of very low order. And, and, and most of the districts have just agreed to come on board or succumb. All right. But if they are going to sense a full-fledged conflict in the Panjshir Valley, it's a big stain on their image of being an inclusive, uh, shall I say, authority, which is taking under control the whole of Afghanistan. So they will also have to think before fighting a war. Also, as I said, you start a war, but finishing it is not in your hands today. All right? It's not in your hands. Uh, what the end game of that will be, they're also wise enough to know. And the Panjshiris also know. And the international community will wake up 
if the war starts in right earnest. Thank you, sir. Now, Sanjeev, sir, I'd like to take this forward with you with regards uh, PTP you had mentioned some time back. Uh, one of the major demands that the Pakistanis have from the Taliban is to keep the TTP and bay. And, uh, you know, having said the fact that the Pakistanis do have quite a bit of say with them, and today there was a report that they've given a list of some 60 or 70 people that the Afghan, uh, they've requested the Afghans to, Afghan Taliban to hand them over here so that they can sort them out. The situation if wherein, uh, wherein the Afghan Taliban actually puts a little bit of curb onto the TTP will result in some amount of disenchantment within the ranks of that place. And one has always noticed that when a certain terror outfit gets disenchanted, they go to the extreme. The extreme in this region is uh, one of the things that everybody fears is Al-Qaeda or even further extreme is Daesh or IS. Do you see this sort of a situation, you know, happening when the Afghans actually try and control this entire movement and hitting them back? Because the, the IS and the Taliban don't look eye to eye as well. So that seems to be another threat coming out from there. What is your opinion, sir? Well, as far as the TTP is concerned, first and foremost, we must be very clear that it is, I mean, not that nationality matters in these issues, but it is predominantly Pakistani nationals. Yeah. All right. They are nationals. Who, who are uh, uh, who have grown up in what is in the territory of Pakistan, and um, they have a three-point enemy: Pakistan, China, and the United States. And the TTP, in some ways, is far more dangerous than the Taliban because they've always had very fine relationships with the Al Qaeda, ISIS. They have cross exchange of information, knowledge, funding. Uh, they've always had that relationship. Because they were a small group and they had to fight for existence. The origin is, as you know, it was the 13 factions which were put together by their founder, Hakitola Mesud. And then the Mesud line continued uh, as, as, as leadership. But I want to draw a line to what you are alluding to now. Their present leader, Noor Wali Mesud, he is being credited by being not only a warrior but an intellectual. He seems to have got rid of the internal divisions. He has got the group cut together. He has relocated them. They were first had gone into the northern parts of, of uh, Afghanistan when they were chased out by the Pakistani army. Then they came to the east. Now they've come to the southern province, right? Where they are just uh, hop across in, 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 into their, their home territories of Waziristan. All right. So not only has he rejuvenated them, he's relocated them, and he's all set to go. And whatever inputs we have of the TTP, they're thrilled with what the Taliban has been able to achieve in Afghanistan. All right? It's a, it's a great oxygen to them. As far as Taliban restricting them, I said very clearly in the past, when there were opportunities, when Taliban could do it, they shied away. There is a brotherhood. You know, uh, there, there is a famous uh, memo written by uh, General Petraeus in which he listed all these entities and he says, I, even, I cannot understand after all the briefings in CENTCOM and, and my headquarters in Afghanistan, what is the relationship between Al-Qaeda, IS, Taliban, TTP? I can't understand it, but there's one hell of a relationship. Okay, so now the point of the matter you must remember is they are all Pashtun at the back of it. They are all followers of Pashtun Valley. They are people who have very, very strong tribal loyalties and entities. And if it's a question of, of, of you know, giving loyalty to somebody within the tribe, they will cut corners for everything. So uh, to say that there will be a fallout, presently it doesn't seem to be happening. The Taliban have got their hands full. They haven't got time for TTP. Right? When they consolidate, if they consolidate and they decide to turn on the TTP, we will see. But knowing the livelihood of the TTP as it has been, it is likely to morph and go somewhere else and continue its operations because their funding is intact, right? Interesting. ISIS and Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda less, ISIS more. ISIS exists in the mind. You think you could destroy ISIS in Syria? Can you destroy ISIS in Iraq? You can't. Because they have this concept, that particular, shall I say, uh, orientation of extreme thinking, which is actually alien to Islam. It's alien to Islam has this concept of a caliphate in its mind. 
and they have the concept of a territory linked to that caliphate. Any opening that is given, any oxygen that is given to that, they will occupy it because now, you know, now it, they have tasted the, 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 the power of Raqqa. They tasted the fact that even though they were bashed and thrown out, in corners they still exist. And, and, and since it is in the mind, it, you know, I, I mean, I, I must tell you, you know, you talk about, you asked about brutality, about the, you know, whether the Taliban will change their ways. In 2014, at the height of the ISIS expansion in Syria, there is a gentleman called Abu Naji. Abu Naji has written an authoritative work on management of savagery. All right. And that authoritative work was used by the ISIS. Uh, uh, till they proclaimed, uh, in 16, they proclaimed the caliphate. So all these, shall I say, all these elements exist. They're already there in the thought process. If the option comes, they will be exercised. But if you ask, ask me whether it's going to happen now, no. Whether there's going to be pressure on TTP now, no. Whether it happens subsequently and they will be eliminated, I have my doubts. All right, I have my doubts. Because eventually, it will be the brotherhood of Pashtuns which will bail, bail them out. General Azmahin, sir, your thoughts on this particular topic? I think General Langer has covered it extremely well. I'll only say that uh, I endorse it completely, his viewpoint completely. The Islamic State, well, uh, it's a different terrorist group completely. Uh, it's a, it, it was an offshoot from the Al-Qaeda, as you're aware. It came up as a part of the AQII in, in Iraq. It's then went into, into, into Syria. Uh, got vanquished from there after the famous battles of Mosul and Raqqa and places like that. And today actually is in a virtual, in a virtual state. Uh, it still has tremendous finances available to it. The, why, the reason why it has come into this, this particular region is uh, the very fact that I explained in my earlier intervention. This is the region where there is the maximum potential for renegade activity, may I say. There is available strategic space. There is uh, Islam available. 72 million Muslims in Central Asia. 22 million in Xinjiang. Afghan, 39 million in Afghanistan. Pakistan, 200 million. So it's a large Islamic region or two. And uh, already the problems of feudalism, the problems of, uh, uh, you know, turbulence existing in the region is suits the Islamic State ideally. So we haven't heard of the Islamic State too much in this area in the recent past. Uh, two years ago, if you remember, it, it did enter here. That's the time when news broke out of a Kerala family also having gone and joined up with them in, in, uh, in um, uh, northern Afghanistan and things like that. So then we haven't heard too much of it. But definitely these groups are all salivating at the, uh, the thought of the kind of environment which has been created here by the by the withdrawal from the Americans, the sudden withdrawal by the Americans, the strategic space that has been created with all kinds of potential. And may I say, Pakistan perhaps is this country which is going to be extremely vulnerable to the activities of all of them. And that's why I entirely agree that the Tariqa Taliban Pakistan will be salivating the maximum. They've already given out their threats to the Pakistan army. And uh, in the very near future, you'll probably start hearing all this again. The last time this well, they were involved with the Pakistan Army, 2014 to 2018 Operation Zarebe Az, which uh, the Pakistanis launched, had one third of the Pakistan Army involved with the trying to control the Tariq -e Taliban. So that is the kind of threat which actually exists. Today. Yeah. So for my last uh, question, I'd like a small, you know, short comment. Of course, a lot has been spoken during this uh, talk itself about India and the potential threat to India. Uh, just as a closing comment, sir, what does Taliban look at, in your opinion, with regards to India? What, what do they have to see and what do they expect out of India? On this, uh, these will be the concluding ideas also. Um, the safest uh, response in a question like this is too early to say, right? <laughs> Which is what every analyst is saying these days. Wait and watch. Yes. <laughs> And that's the stupidest response you can have. Wait and watch. And so I evolved my own terminology. I said, no, analyze and calibrate. Right? And then keep analyzing all the time and keep calibrating. Because you can't say, I'm just waiting and watching. Now, uh, 
obviously there, there are schools of thought in india about whether uh, we made a mistake by going along the american way completely 100% without keeping our options open or why didn't we think that one day the americans would withdraw did we ever think that the americans would withdraw by winning a war in afghanistan the graveyard of empire all this was perhaps flawed thinking at that particular time i mean that is all a part of the past of the moment now the simple question is do we engage with the taliban or do we not engage with the i think uh, the time has come when uh, our interests are very much uh, in front of us at the moment we still got people stuck there uh, we have to get them out we have to make sure that every indian is safe before we take any major decision or at least make our major decisions known um, the second thing is we got assets there well the americans left behind billions of dollars worth of military assets we have left behind 3 billion dollars worth of uh, assets i hope we hope that the taliban will not be stupid uh, to deny them to the pakistan to the afghan people but uh, by and large the larger game is more important we feel that um, at least i feel that uh, it's not an automatic it's not a it's not just a a, a given that uh, the taliban is in the hands of the pakistanis and therefore the pakistanis are going to make sure that the taliban always acts against the interests of india the taliban is going to look at afghanistan interests too and it knows that legitimacy is one of the very very important aspects it also knows that the people to people relationship between india and the people of afghanistan is is historic and very strong it also knows that there is a lot of sentiment in the speech today it's not 20 years ago a new generation women all kinds of people different groups is the all this is going to contribute to things to how well the taliban can actually manage the future they are also looking at legitimacy to attract investments for the future they don't want to burn the boats with everyone and and, and they don't want to unnecessarily create issues with the international financial institutions who have already sanctioned them to some extent so given all this i think the taliban is so far has not made a negative statement against india he's only been making small statements which don't mean much but don't mean anything negative at the same time keeping all this in mind i think our options must be kept all those who are saying we can't deal with terrorists we can't deal with obstacles we can't deal with radicals we can't deal with people who don't believe in human rights and uh, women rights and things like that i think you all this is very good is idealistic but national interest is also something which you have to keep in mind and therefore i'm sure the homework is already being done that come the opportune moment maybe a, a line of a, a line of engagement not necessarily uh, completely visible it could be in the back channels it remains open with the taliban maybe different elements of the taliban and and uh, hope we can take this forward from there so therefore i would be one person who would strongly recommend that keep everything positive towards the taliban since the taliban has not been negative to you please don't be negative to the taliban interesting sir general sanjeev sir may i request you to kind of uh, close this discussion with your comments sir yeah okay so on this specific issue i think uh, the 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 i think the footwork which right now the, the government is undertaken and the diplom diplomacy is undertaken with uh, Uh, Afghanistan is correct. But right now, we are focused on the human beings who need to be relocated, and not necessarily only uh, those who are uh, Hindus and Sikhs. There are a lot of Afghans whose families are here who are getting visas and coming across, and that is that human priority is the priority number one. All right. Uh, so, therefore, conversation is already existing between uh, us and, and, and the government, whatever whatever the government is right now. and i and like everybody else i mean we we, we are not in some strange uh, uh, singular basket like everybody else we we waiting to see what kind of consolidation takes place and what kind of nationhood uh, emerges and and uh, there is enough enough maturity in the indian system to deal with all kinds of governments you know uh, over in the history of our existence so uh, we will deal with whatever we get at the appropriate time right that that's that's a shall i say uh, an important fact we must also remember there is a huge human bridge which has been created apart from history in the recent years due to due to the free flights for their exports 
which came into India. There are about 60,000 Afghans who have studied and gone back to uh, Afghanistan, and there are more uh, who, are, who are here under education who go back. They're part of a diaspora. Human beings, unfortunately, are not largely logical. They are emotional. The emotional linkage between the Afghan population and the Indian population is intense. The Taliban is aware of it. I, I, in my interaction with, with uh, a lot of the uh, Afghans, for medical attention, they would not like to go to Pakistan. They were forced to go because of lack of money, but they would prefer to come to India. So all this has to go into the Taliban calculation if they want to be inclusive and a government. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think, uh, sorry, but we've got very little time left, so I'm just going to wrap it up. Uh, so I'd like to thank both of you for these, some very insightful views. I think you've brought about a very realistic picture of what is happening in the ground with Taliban, Pakistan, India, China, USA, and you know all the other players around the world who are interested in this particular subject. I'd like to you know humbly request uh, both of you to, of course, keep a little time for me for the future, wherein we can actually look forward and see what all we've discussed and how far all these situations are coming into play, sir. Thank you so much, uh, General Hasnain and General Langer, to, for joining me this, uh, this evening, sir. Thank you.